All right. Is it real? Is it real? <laughs> um, all right. Looks like we're live. Says we're live. All right. This is excellent news. Um, well, here we are. I'm. <laughs> this is this is Kat Udero at a lovely coffee shop in um, Omaha, Nebraska. And so it might be a little noisy. I might have a little backbeat every now and again, but um, <laughs> but this is this is what you do. This is what you do when you're on the road doing shows. So um, with that, I am Kat Udera, psychic empath, psychic wrangler, and celestial medium. Welcome to Third Eye Salon, where we drop the veils of illusion in order to take a deep, fresh look at reality. And today we're looking beyond the veils of color, sound, frequency, and ancient healing techniques made new by our friend and longtime supporter, Arthur Artist, Carla Macbeth. <laughs> but before we say hello to Carla, <laughs> I'm going to flip us into Brady Bunch for you. And we're going to say hello to the lovely Linda Coulterberg, psychic and conscious business coach. How are you today, Miss Linda? I am so excited to feature Carla. I just, I love when one of our members steps up and shines. So um, this is, this is just very special to my heart because I've talked to her in the past and she has so many gifts to share with this world. And we get to be a part of that. So um, with that, I'll be your live stream chat host. And as always, my policy is to play nice or get out. And play nice also means asking questions. So make sure that you ask questions during the show um, so we can get them answered. Look, please uh, like, share, and subscribe because that's how people find us. The sooner you hit that like button, the sooner people can find us because that's how the algorithms work. And um, be sure to uh, check out the boxes below if you want to work with any of us. Um, join our Facebook group if you haven't. And for all of those who have donated, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, with that, Hi, Carla. <laughs> Hi, Linda. <laughs> so, Carla, we are so excited that you're with us today. We are going to jump into your story and we're going to kind of pull apart your bio and really examine who you are, because um, there's just a lot of there's a lot of things you've synthesized together in this magnificent work that you're bringing to the world now. And before we do dive into that, though, I have to harass a couple more people because um, uh, that is part of my job and duty as as a co-host here. So Jason Atkins, magical bitch that he is, um, is a, a psychic medium, and he's also a channeler of um, incredible uh, ET art. And Jason, how are you? How are things in Alabama today? Cold. <laughs> um, you know, Alabama weather, it's 81 days. This morning, it was like 26 like, will you make up your mind? And everything is yellow outside. Um, oh. The trees are having an orgy. So, you know, everything's yellow. Oh, oh my. my. Oh, um, my. Well, I'm about, excited to be here. It's about 14 degrees out here. So yeah. I understand. Like, I'm like, oh, Whoa. can't wait to go back to Denver where it's going to be at least 30. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Um, thank you, Mr. Jason. And then we have got Rosetta. She is the mantra maven and holy sick healer, Rosetta Jazz Hands. How are you, lady? I am fabulous. I'm so excited to be here with you, Carla. And I love oh. color. Color has been important to me in my life. And, you know, I have felt the healing power of color. And so I am just so excited to learn from you and learn more about color. Oh, thank you. Excellent. All right. Well, I'm going to flip us back into uh, speaker view and I'm going to dive into Carla's bio, but I'm doing, I am going to do it a bit different today where I'm going to go through, I've, I've highlighted some areas because I want Carla to really give us some um, insight to what she has experienced um, as, because, because I mean, yes, she's got, she's written this book. She's uh, somebody who's working with color. She's working with frequency. She's working with sound, but she also has incredible uh, fey energy. She has um, celestial connections. She's got uh, this connection with ancient healing arts. So it's, it's important that we kind of really, I, I want us to really paint the landscape. She's an artist, like she's a writer. She's, she's all of these things, right? So I really want to be able to unpack this. And um, so we understand who we're exactly dealing with today. <laughs> um so <laughs> <Hell> no. <laughs> <laughs> 
So Carla was born to a trumpet player and a beautiful misfit a long time ago, a long time ago, isn't that sweet, in Los Angeles. She learned early that there are lovely people in the world in quite unexpected places. She also learned to see beyond the expected places for all those lovely experiences. What does that sentence mean right there, Carla? She also learned to see beyond the expected places for all those lovely experiences. Oh, um, well, I'll give you an example. Um, I was a toddler. I don't think I was walking yet. And my father took me to a rehearsal at Capitol Records. And I was, he put me on the floor of this very dirty office with, that had a, a pinup girl um, calendar and black walls and, you know, all this stuff. And I was sitting there playing and somebody walked in and bent, bent down and was very nice to me and was talking to me and, you know, very soothing voice. It was uh, Nat King Cole because he was doing, my father was playing trumpet for some uh, recording sessions at Capitol Records for him and his band. Or I think he may have been doing solos at the time. So that was unexpected, but it really made an impression on me. And then um, I also met a couple of other people that way. So just falling into situations you know, it could have been considered a really bad experience for other people. For me, it was eye-opening, life-changing. I had a connection with the voice. And then voices after that always connected with me. And you, um, there you go. You had a connection with the voice. What does that mean? Yes. With his voice, Nat King Cole's voice. Okay. As a baby, I... It imprinted on me, the soothing voice. And then later on, voices were important. And I, I tended to be attracted to people's voices because I could read them better than, you know, when some of them were dissonant, some of them were soothing, some of them were interesting and complex. So I, by coming from a musician background, my, you know, my genetics, music was in my genes. So you know, sound was very important to me. And I discovered color later. That makes sense though. I mean, you, yeah, you're coming from this artistic background. You've gotten, you're, you're with somebody who's really like a musical giant in the world and not just because of his talent, but because of his presence, like his talent and his presence, it's all of that whole thing together. And he comes in as this like agent of soothing, this agent of comfort. And with that deep, rich tone, sort of sort of is this initiation of like what's soothing, what's healing, what's what's a soothing tone, what's a healing tone, what's a, you know, and being able to then discern empathically and being able to read people's energies from the tone of their the frequency of their their voice. Yeah, essentially, I think that's what happened initially. Um, also, he was very, very kind. And he, he interacted with babies. He had a, you know, he could do that. He, he could connect with me as a baby. So that was pretty cool. And then later on, um, I think that was a theme throughout. And that's how I got interested in, uh, you know, I dabbled in music and various things, but as a, um, as a creative outlet, not, not as a career. But so if there's more, go ahead. <laughs> fantastic well thanks for breaking that down because I, I i knew that yeah there's more of this where she's done this she's 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 a fae being so she can coach kind of mystifies and hides and things so you have to crack them open and and uh bring them out into the light so um graduating from high school in the turbulent 60s she went to art school to escape political violence there she had her first visions of color and non-color Previously, previously, she worked in black and ink and white paper. So now tell me there, what does that mean? She, you had your first visions of color and non-color. What does that mean? Oh, I can give you a visual series of three slides to show you that it went Perfect. from something, actually for one thing to, 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 to another thing automatically. So I'll show you. Let me set this one up really quick. Um. Let's see. I think I'm going to. I should share the screen first, right? Um, yeah. Well, get, go ahead. Go ahead. Get set up, and um, we can certainly and then you'll see share. If, no, no, you'll share, but you get set up, and we'll see if any of our other lovely co-hosts 
have and Jason have um just kidding. Um <laughs> any questions. Okay, I'm set up. And the problem is I can't share when I'm set up full screen. Let's see. Oh technical. That's okay. We didn't think to to test this when we when we so. <laughs> it didn't occur to me. It didn't occur to me either. Um, did, did not you, occur to me. Did you okay. have a question? Oh, wait, there we go. All right. There Boom. Look at you. All right. Um, oh, that's, wow. That's so beautiful. I'm going to mute myself. Yeah. It's okay. There's the current slide. Okay. That's, that's my thing. I was doing, um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Did I do um, yes. sound? Yes. Did yes. You're great. Sound? We can hear now you. We can hear you, Carla. Carla. Now I can do sound. Okay. Okay. And you can hear me. She can't. All right. Okay. So um, this is obviously self-portrait. And I used to work in black and white, pencil, anything else. I went to art school, but I didn't go into painting or anything like that. I went into sculpture because I essentially wanted to be um, an environmental designer, but I flunked drafting. So I went into sculpture. And um, so I didn't want to work in color. I wanted to work in textures. This is a piece that I, called Night Sky that because I worked in latex and um, it was a little precursor of some other things that happened later on in my life, which is very interesting. But um, so I worked in black and white and gray, very happy with it. This is a latex painting, colored latex. And I, I did some stained glass. As you can see, I'm afraid of color. So I did glass. So it essentially isn't stained. So it's just glass and an artichoke. Then something happened. I don't remember what exactly happened, but I went crazy. I found, I, I said, no, I have to do this. I have to do this. And I just put every color I could come up with in glass together with absolutely no reason, no design, nothing planned out. I just put it together. As you can see, it doesn't even fit a square. So I just exploded in feeling what color was really like. And um, so that's essentially, that's essentially how that happened. And then later on, it was years and years later, I sort of figured out why that happened. So here we are. So let's talk about that. Why did, um, I, I want to parallel, if, if something happened in artistically where you exploded in color, um, then something else in your life had to have opened up dramatically to say that this is okay, it's safe now. And I'm wondering how either, if you, you can tell about, talk about what that was or how your life changed, what was the other thing that happened? Because it's not going to just show up on your art, you know, because it's, it's all a fractal reality. Oh, it was a complete life change. I was away from the old homestead, away from the, you know, family, whatever they were. And for the first time, I was living on my own, alone. I loved living alone. And I was in art school, which interestingly enough, wasn't that creative. People were not that creative. So the work that I did, and a lot of it, I mean, the one that I showed you that's the latex painting was the least creative. And that was something that someone wanted to put in an exhibit in downtown Oakland. It was a juried exhibit. So they asked me to join it and I put it in there. Um, but some of the other stuff was just groundbreaking for people, for the, the teachers too, but they weren't. So these were things that I came up with just out of my head and discovering different materials and connecting essentially the human organism with things beyond it. And what I was trying to do in art, and this is interesting because I think it's something that I've kept a, um, a theme throughout my life, is to capture with a piece, and because I only worked really in sculpture, capture the moment where you look at something and before you recognize it and your, and your mind, your uh, mind, categorizes it and and 
analyzes it and puts it in a box and connects it with, with experience and empirical knowledge and blah, blah, blah. Before that happens, there's a moment of awe where you don't know what it is. And you are sometimes you're horrified and fascinated at the same time. Sometimes you're just fascinated. And sometimes you're just frozen. And I wanted to capture that moment. So I did that. Um, I kind of did that with the stained glass too. It was like, whoa, <laughs> that's not what we wanted. That's not what we expected. Oh, oh, interesting. But then I also captured it a little with some of the other work I was doing because it wasn't easily recognizable. But I did, I patterned some of my sculptures on um, sea animals, the very deep sea. They were just discovering them at the time. This was quite a while ago. And there, were, there was just some deep sea exploration and they were finding these extraordinary nudibranches and anemones and, and animals they hadn't, qual they hadn't quite categorized yet that were extraordinary, beautiful and unusual and frightening. And so I, I patterned a little bit of that on that. And then I added um, the, I added a component of human skin, which was, I discovered using um, latex painted on, um, on plastic and then pulling it off and then making it, you know, kind of wrinkly, looked a lot like human skin. So then I would connect that feeling of awe with my, my memory of, on, you know, deep sea exploratory um, things at the time and animals coming from, you know, somewhere not understood and the human organism. And the connection, I don't think I made at the time. I made it on a very topical level. I was just trying to get to that one spot in someone's mind where they're in awe. So that's where I was. And do you feel like, I mean, this is what I, this is what I get from it. And I want to know, you know, obviously this is new to you, I know. <laughs> well, it's new to me, but I'm feeling it. And um, cause it feels like to me, there was a desire. Like, I feel like a soul desire to express that. It's ex the phrase that I've, I've had with me for years that God lives in the unexpected. Like this moment, is this a human being? Is this not a human being? Is this light? Is this color? Is this a creature? It, this is unexpected. We don't know what it is. And that's what God is. Like that raw moment where you're with God, like everything is nothing. Nothing is everything. And that's kind of how I would take it. And what's your reflection on that? That's new to me. That's, that's, that's an insight. Okay. That's why I have a few friends to give me insights. <laughs> What do you feel? I mean, and also feel free to hop in, Linda or Jason. But what do you feel about that piece in terms of what you were? What was your soul saying? What was that? What was that moment of? Because this is a, this is a liberating moment. Because then, like, there's this thing of like, and also you getting to undump who you unpack who you are. You're away from home. You get to un, uh, dump out your identity. You get to dump out who you are. What is it? I don't know. It's reflecting back to me. It's that that's the unknown, and that's okay. It's scary, and it's okay. Um. I felt like, uh, first of all, I was always hiding who I really was from everyone because I wasn't an idiot. You know, I, I, I wanted to protect myself. So I was comfortable hiding. And this time I, I could be myself. And I was very, um, I was very liberated in the sense I had music available that I was interested in. I had, I was in Oakland on the, on the cusp of Berkeley in the early 1970s, living in a little studio apartment on college and Broadway and going to art school like a block across the street. And then, so that was just, I mean, that was, at the time it was great, but now I look back and I say, wow, that was extraordinary. That was an extraordinary experience and it will never happen again because nothing, the elements aren't there anymore. The people aren't there, you know, the 
the little shops, going into the little shops and seeing different things that are being created. Like they were starting with the little coffee houses, coffee shops, where you could buy coffees and different kinds of coffees and things like Aladdin's and Pete's and, you know, and Pete's came up, came on later, but Aladdin's was the first one. And the, all the little shops and the little extraordinary experiences were there. So I was completely liberated in the sense that I could be who I wanted to be and I could enjoy what I wanted to enjoy. And it ended up that I wanted to be multicultural, multilingual, and uh, I was comfortable in it and just sort of explore everything. Like I was from another, okay, I'll say it. Like I was from another <laughs> planet. And, um, you know, <laughs> this was fun. Let's just enjoy. <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, that was the experience. So everything, all of the work that I did, I did it for myself. And it was, it, it was, everybody was fascinated. The teachers were, the, the students were different because this was very different. I mean, art school was where rich kids went and parents sent their kids their kids out of Brazil because they wanted them not to be there. And so they sent them to art school, you know, <laughs> they weren't necessarily creative people. And a lot of them just wanted to be in the scene. And a lot of them just wanted to, you know, it was all kinds of people. Posers. Losers. No, they no, were pose posers, 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 art posers. It's hard to say because you know what? The whole <laughs> culture was posers. So, you know, it's like if everybody's a poser and the culture is posery, then are they really posers? They're just there. <laughs> um, yeah, it makes me think of great Grace Jones and the the New York art scene and the whole thing of um did you ever listen to great Grace Jones? I love Grace Jones as, you know, I've seen her only music film, but I haven't talked to her about the art scene or read anything about that she's she has a has a line um i'm very superficial i hate everything official like it's like <laughs> it's like it's like i'm so pretentious like and i'm so artistic i'm so like on the edge like it's like it becomes its own little weird like in inverse you know because it's like yeah. wanting to make sure that you're so trendy and it's like that's not really what art is about art is about like expression of the essence so speaking of expression yeah. of the essence i'll get back onto your your bio here um and so then here's a huge switcheroonie for us all to to uh measure with you she went on to study law after art school moved to new york and wrote so that's one sentence and i'm like how many years of your life was that and um let us know what that was about you went to study law after art school moved to new york and wrote do tell Oh, that's a compression <laughs> of experiences. Huge compression. Yeah. I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. I'll okay. Another connection. I'll tell you the the sequence of events really quickly. Um after after art school, I had a BFA. And by the way, in the first week I discovered after, even after I was invited to be in the juried exhibit, because people were saying, this is really good, blah, blah, blah. I didn't want to be an artist because I didn't want to make useless objects. And I just felt like this is, there's more, there's more to do. I was, my analytics, analytic side of my brain was taught, was not exercised enough. I was bored with it. And I could, I saw that happening, the trendy and all, I didn't see any I saw danger in it for me because I liked being behind the scenes a little bit. I was a little uncomfortable being in front because I tended, I, I was afraid of being targeted a little bit. I guess I had a little bit of a fear of that. Now, when you say targeted, targeted for what? Being amazing? What were you um, afraid of being targeted well, for? Being targeted by jealous people, targeted by people that wanted to, you know, essentially debunk me to say that I was, you know, like a kid from wherever I was from or whatever, you know, just mean like, things, mean like people. Debunk you, debunk you as an artist and say that you're not credible in your field, basically. Probably, yeah. Okay. All it right. was an amorphous kind of fear. It wasn't a real fear. Actually, there was something that did happen when I was living okay. there that did make me afraid. And then it occurred to me 
that I have to be more careful about being targeted. I used to uh, walk across the street to go to school. I was carrying objects that I was working on and things like that. Next door to my building was a guy who owned a bodybuilding academy. And he was this like very short, kind of like muscly guy, old, you know, like 40s. And I was in my 20s and was always, you know, in and out, like doing stuff. He had a fixation on me in a very bizarre way. So one time I, in the middle of the day, I was, you know, coming out of my building, I was going to cross the street and he ran up to me and punched me in the face, but his fist stopped just like five inches from my face. And then he turned around and ran back into his shop. It was a very bizarre thing. He used to always look at me and I was a little nervous. Now I was cuter, obviously, but I don't think it was that. I think it was something else. And so it occurred to me that I, and of course we, my friend that was with me, she, my friend in the drawing department was with me and she said, oh my God, we have to call the police. We have to call the police. We called the police and the police came and they went and they talked to him and they came back and they said, well, we don't know what's going on you know, just stay away from him. You know, that's the police were great back then and still are. So, um, so it occurred to me, there's something more and I have to be so careful. I cannot allow myself to be targeted. So that's why I didn't go into art to be an artist and to be. Oh, it's noticed. really, Oh, I see. There's a general, a general fear of um, vulnerability. Because once you oh, are yeah. seen and recognized as an artist, then yes, I mean, you, there are all sorts of things. It opens you up to all sorts of more attention from people that you can't control whether they what they think about you or don't think about you and all that stuff. I think it's more on a on a metaphysical level. Okay. That my energy hit the guy. I don't know what was going on with the guy, but he was very dark and confused. Okay. And I, I've always okay. been able to kind of read people. He was dark and he was confused. And so I think he was angry with me because I wasn't something. He didn't, he didn't see that I was doing something I should have been doing or not doing or whatever, but it doesn't matter. It's like because of the energy, because I never, I mean, I wasn't really a partier. I wasn't a, I was just doing my thing. I was an artist and I loved music and I went to music things and I, cooked you know and I had friends and that was it but it was just so I realized later on I have to really be conscious because of my energy sometimes it'll set people off and it always did around my own family always always so I have to be you know careful and I think that's what made me go that other direction which was self-protection law da, 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 you know and just going into my my analytic side of my brain as opposed to my creative side, because then I was out there. My, everything was expanded. I was out there and maybe not being out there wasn't so safe. I don't think it still is actually well, I being think out that's, there, but. I think that's where you're at right now. I mean, here we are, you know, how many years later and you're finally doing it where you're letting your little light shine and you're taking out from under the bush the you know what's the song <laughs> this is a light of mine i'm gonna let it shine you know like hide it away like you're not gonna hide it anymore and you're gonna you're gonna let it out and i think that you're you know you're obviously you're older you're wiser savvier um but i think that there's a common theme right there and hopefully stop that um there is a common theme for light workers who are afraid of being seen and are only afraid of glowing so much and afraid that if you know it's that tall poppy syndrome if you once you're taller than other people that's when your head gets lopped off and it's like oh so it's not safe to be tall it's not safe to be my full expression and i think that you know it's i see it again and again i've and i've lived it and all that but i think that it's a very common thing of us having to fill up all of our space now in order to really be able to lead you can't hide and lead at the same time good True. luck good luck with that one you know so here you are you you really are are, are biting off the 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 bullet linda did you want to say something i see you're off mute yeah i i just want to back up a little bit you, mm -hmm. you made a comment that my my ears went 
what um, when you went from being black and white, you said you were afraid of color. And I'm curious if that also, if, if that reflected in any way on your worldviews, was your worldview very black and white? Was it, was there nuance in there? Did you have a lot of rules? And, and how did that reflect in your art? Oh, um, oh, I think I, I know what you're talking about. I think what it is, not so much rules, but I was trying to be creative with the analytic part of my brain and not use the creative part of my brain that was connected to the etheric body and everything. I was trying to avoid that. So just to be analytic and I worked in pen and ink, which is very detailed. And so I did a lot of that. And then when I worked in just, you know, sort of like earth tones, it was very analytic, you know, this, this substance made this shape and everything. So I think the transition was really to, in, to um, open up both sides of my brain, both hemispheres and go into the creative, which then connected with, as you know, the outer world, okay. the, the, other, the other realms. And that I think that was a direct, absolute direct connection when I started opening up to the other realms. And I don't know what, what started it. I and mean, it could have been something because I was going to like, um, you know, things like um, uh, Javanese shadow dance, shadow puppet dancing uh, festival at the church down the street. And it was like, went on for two days and it was like, two dollars everything was two dollars to get in <laughs> so everything was really cheap and easy and then I would go in and then things were you know I would just get a sense of the feeling of the culture and what was going on and their interaction with with the uh gods and goddesses that they were working with and then their presence as well in that in that particular um presentation because that that really felt like there was something there and those kinds of things I think really triggered my switching over and saying oh it wasn't gradual it was just like open the creative side and that's it then it was open I think does that make sense to you yes Linda? yes Excellent. it does and it, and it helps you know coming from the uh, starting out wanting to do Ar um, architecture and structure. Yes. That would make a lot of sense that that black and white is where you went to. And some of the best architects are the ones that have pulled in the full spectrum and the color and broken all the rules of architecture. So I can yeah. see that in your, your brain of, of bringing both sides of it into full fruition. Well, I sadly, I, I, they had they made me drop um, uh, drafting one mm -hmm. a one <laughs> because I couldn't read the slide rule. Yeah, I just couldn't do it. It was like something some block in my mind said you cannot do this. So I think I was being pushed away from being analytic immediately. You know, as soon as I was in that environment, it was some my guides. Somebody was just saying, "Get out of this." You know. You're free now. You're yourself. You can do what you experience all this. So I essentially got pushed into sculpture out of environmental design. And yet I know from, and I'm kind of alluding to other things we've talked about, part of your, your journey is also included. How do you bring color into a defined structure to expand it and to change the energy of it. So I love, we'll get into that probably in the future of our discussion, but you're still being able to pull those in on your terms, which is what I hope all of us learn to do is take those talents and move them into our own terms in how we show up in the world. Oh, thank you. 
I'm I'm not trying to, you know, I think if I'm on the ladder, I don't want to look down, actually. <laughs> so if I'm accomplishing that, I'm just going to keep going. I don't want to really be that self and analytical because I'm afraid it'll go, oh, geez, really? I'm going out? <laughs> but uh, thank you for that observation. The only way is up, lady. The only way <laughs> is up. I think there was a song. <laughs> we'll have to put that song on, on the uh, the only way is up. Um, speaking of gay ditties from the 80s, Jason, did you have any uh, questions that you wanted to? Not really a question. It's more, I guess more of a observation. And it kind of ties into what Linda was saying about the, you know, the starting in the black and white with this idea of wanting to be like this architect and building and then um, you know, Carla then said the next set, she moved to like these earth tones or these neutrals. Right. And then it's this color. So it's like a progression. So it really is like an analogy of like this spiritual progression of this metaphysical growth that you've had. Right. We start off very black and white, everything by the book. Then, Oh, the something happens. Right. And now we're finally starting to see, it's almost like the movie. Um, what's the movie where the, they're all black and white and they start to turn color. Oh yes, and they um, as they go back in time and and uh, they go into a movie and then yeah. as they're bringing yes 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 yeah. When it's you know the one guy that mm. that works in the shop, he he starts to see color and he starts painting, um, and like you see the the progression as a person that's happening and there it's kind of like with this metaphor of starting off from black and white and then moving into color. So yeah, that's just an observation that I had. Oh I think wow! That's, oh, go ahead. Thank you, Jason. That's, you know, you're absolutely right. And I think it was, it wasn't completely just black and white to color. You're right. I did work with the earth tones and the skin tones and light and, um, you know, trying to get light to go through it, to change the tone and just, you know, increments, but it was a short period of time. I went from that to this to boom, color. And then I went back. <laughs> Then when I went to uh, law school, I went back to full analytic, the full analytics. Well, sometimes we do that pendulum swing. We integrate sides and we integrate halves. Um, and uh, speaking of um, somebody who hates color and has nothing to do with uh, creativity, Rosetta, did you want to ask a... a... <laughs> So, I think Rosetta is so like in vibe with this because your story, your journey, I can just like there's parallels with with Rosetta. So it's just beautiful. I do feel like we're kind of living a parallel life because so many <laughs> of your experiences. Um, yeah, I totally relate to. But um, so just kind of viewing my life from some the lens that you just brought. Um, so I wear a lot of black and white but I like a pop of color. So just curious. Um, so is that kind of like, you know, not fully going into my, um, my colorful self? Am I being reserved? It feels like I'm trying to put color in a box maybe and not, I, I don't know what, what's kind of your um, thought on that, like living in black and white, but having like one tiny little color somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, when I moved to New York from California, everybody wore black. It was a, it was a uniform and things were always black, black, black. And of course, you know, having to get, um, the chubby sizes, you know, they always wanted you to wear black. <laughs> because it made you look less chubby, but <laughs> it doesn't, it just looks terrible. Um, so I, when I was doing this research, and this is coming back to you, Rosetta, when I was doing this research about color, um, I was looking for the direct relationship between the, the full spectrum visible I didn't go into ultraviolet and infrared. I just went into the visible spectrum and the effect on the human organism. And when I was doing the research, I found, first of all, that wearing black, because you do your, the vibration of the color is next to your body when you're wearing a color. And wearing black does something that's not good to the body. 
So I noticed this because I was still wearing a lot of black. And so I found that um, I would get, you know, rashes on my legs from different things. So I was sensitive to things. And if I wore black pants or black socks over it, it would get worse. If I wore blue or, or white, it would get better. So there's a direct correlation because not only it had nothing to do with whether it was warm outside or cold outside or sweating or anything, it had to do with the effect of black, which is really more of white is like all the colors together. Black is the absence of color. And um, there's something that it does to the body where the, the body, the physical human organism needs light. So it's more you, you're denying yourself light when you wear all black. And the one color is just, you know, a lifeline. <laughs> a lifeline. Don't pull me down into the black. Just I, I got this. So does that make sense to you, Rosetta? Yeah, it does. And like, does, like, I was wondering about the color gray too. I mean, it's not quite as intense as black, but is gray is kind of colorless. Gray doesn't, it doesn't create like the, the, the effects on the skin. It's, it is more of a neutral because it does have, it's a combination of white, and black. So the white is all the colors together of the spectrum. So it's still, it's a little bit of a neutral. I would, you know, it isn't going to hurt you to wear gray and it isn't necessarily going to hurt you to wear black. But if you are conscious of it and you do make a change and you know, you will notice a difference. And I think people that constantly wear black and they're around black constantly and everything is black, 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 and the black this black everything and you know black sofas black everything I think it affects them I really do I think it it um what's the word it it curtails their ability to feel and to really or even the body to process properly on a minute on a metabolic level and a um mitochondrial level because so, we are light beings. So it stops the light, essentially. So just curious. So when I wear black, I probably get the most compliments ever. So like, what is that? I, well, <laughs> that's the thing. What you like and what looks good on you isn't necessarily, it may also be something that isn't necessarily what you need because there are different, I mean, people have their cultural norms about things. And uh, for instance, when I moved to New York and I was, you know, just noticing the way people decorated their houses. And especially when I was doing some research to, to write my little book, um, everybody wanted white, stark white, um, clean, you know, sterile um, surfaces, shiny surfaces, no, books or, you know, messy books anywhere, that kind of thing. So everything was white, white, white. And I felt like it just sort of sucked the soul out of the room. Um, but people loved it. They love white. It, there's something about, it's like a status symbol. It's like, if it's all white and it's, there's a white sofa and white this and white bookshelf, but no book and, um, you know, white coffee table that there's something very, elevated in status about it which go ahead you have a feeling about that yes well i'm just thinking um because it's like you know we were talking about black and now we're talking about white and it's almost like too yes. much of anything is 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 the issue but i do feel like like because i think about this in terms of um energy and if you think of a negative vortex versus a positive vortex you know we say negative but that means also magnetic like a magnetic vortex vortex versus an electric vortex like one has energy that fills you up and one has energy that drains you out because sometimes you need to drain out energy. Sometimes you need to fill your mm -hmm. energy up. And so if you're in around the color black where it's devoid and it's pulling things out constantly, then yeah, eventually you're going to be tapping yourself out. If you're around white or it's just like 
all colors, all time, all colors, all time, you know, like then that's almost can be too much, too much stimulus that way. So here's like the, the medicine of the color. Um, and I was going to hop in and read the rest of your bio unless Rosetta has a follow-up question um, or comment. Mm -hmm. No, I'm good for now. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> I don't You're think good I for now or forever, it, but <laughs> you're did... always good. You're always good. <laughs> okay. I'm going to hop in and then we can just pick apart your life a little bit more. Okay. Um, okay. And so <laughs> um, here we are talking about exactly what you just said, experiencing the culture, come in, experiencing the culture of sterile white living rooms, trendy New York clothing that was black on black most of the time and the ever present beige and everything. I hate beige. From interior design to upholstery, she rebelled. Her book, How to Find Love, How to Find and Love Your Small Space, launched June 2021 on Amazon, um, included a large chapter on the need for color in our lives, including our own spaces. Um, when she was researching the book, she like, leaned on references by authors such as Ambika Waters. So let us know why she's important. Finally, she sought out a certification course at Holistic Arts Institute in California to really understand more of the science of the relationship between colors and the visible spectrum and the human organism, which we we're just talking about. So would you let us know who Ambika Waters is and why her work is important to your work? Um, I ran into a book by Ambika Waters uh, years ago at the New York Life Expo. I used to go and just pick up books at the, the little table that where the books were like $2. Everything was $2. And um, little used books. And I got a book by her on color and sound therapy in homeopathy. She's a homeopathist. And uh, from originally from Britain. And she's written about 26 books. But she hasn't just stayed in the area of homeopathy. She has branched into color and sound as part of homeopathic treatments. And homeopathy is very, I mean, it, it's a... It's a study that you have to go through a lot to get certified in. And it's much more, I see it's, I think it's much more acceptable as a, as a mainstream complementary medicine treatment in Europe than it is here. And, um, but it's, it's allowed here. It's considered acceptable, but alternative. And we all know how that is. Um, it's acceptable because you know, it's, it's allowed and people seek it out, but it's not usually, but it's for medicinal purposes and people that seek out homeopathic treatments do it for illnesses or, or injuries. And so I read one of her early books. She did two or three on sound and color therapy. And that's when it really, I really clicked in this and saying, oh, wow. So there is a homeopathic inclusion of color and therapy in therapy and then adding sound to it. So that was part, the reason why she was important is because she used it in a more, in a less strategic, precise medical clinical setting, which homeopathic medicine is. It's more holistic, where you take into consideration the entire person, uh, what's going on with them. And then when you uh, prescribe a homeopathic remedy, it's based on, you know, the concept of like cures like, but it's, it's much more a little bit more broad than just, oh, well, you have a rash, let's get an, you know, a nice rash thing <laughs> for you. Um, no, it's much more, much more holistic than that. So um, I liked her approach. And I learned a lot from her from, and then I ended up meeting her. She's a lovely woman. She uh, gave a, um, a webinar to the a National Homeopathic Institute um, in India and for their continuing education. And so I was invited to sit in and I did that. Um, I've been in touch with her. She did a, did a review of my book and it's on the book, just the color part, because she felt it was, it was I was very... <laughs> very touched and flattered, she felt it was commendable to include the importance of color in one's environment because that basic concept is so isn't even thought of now. 
color is really not when it's not even available in most furniture stores, except for a very, you know, rare occasions. And one chair is this color. Um, but it's not thought of that much as color is important in many ways and not understood at all. So uh, I really, you know, I appreciated her, her kind words and it's on the back of my book for what she said about it. So I've been in touch with her. So she's a really, I wouldn't say a direct mentor because I'm not in homeopathy and I don't want to do that. I just want to use the principles so I can understand it, so I can adapt it to what I'm doing, which is a little different and, and less medical and more in a different way. So um, she's important. And it's W-A-U-T-E-R-S, Ambika, A-M-B-I-K-A. So if you ever look her up, she's written many, many books. She's written things totally off, off that topic about angels and all kinds of stuff. So it's she's a very, very interesting woman. And she now has, um, um, I think like it's a research study place in Tucson, Arizona, where they're doing some more research and they do, they do have some on-site classes and things like that. So she's kind of, I would consider her semi-retired. She's doing a podcast now but she's not really out there like she was before. So it's well worth, you know, checking her out. So um, this is making me think about, um, remember Aunt Amanda Hainline, who was here like a year and a half ago, and I had sent you, uh, remember Amanda, she was the one who talked about color and um, color therapy. She had become psychic, like an, a 30 minute session, a healing session. Remember us talking about that? No. Draw a blank. Okay. Um, Linda is remembering. Yeah. So, cause she was something that you, you, you were excited about her, Carla, and I sent you her information cause this is when you're, you're working on your book. But um, wow. so I, I'm, what I'm, the, why this is important is because there's like a league of people who are using color in this way that is rooted into the true science of color, um, which is frequency and energy. Um, I'm going to see if we can go through, just finish up your bio here and then, um, I want to talk about, um, yeah, I want to talk about your awakening and um, in terms of how that's shown up for you in your world, because that's obviously impacted everything you've done. Um, so now you're talking about Mbika, and so this is where we're going to pick up. Homeopathy works and is respected uh, by many countries in Europe as an acceptable first therapeutic remedy. However, Carla wanted to find non-medical use for this wonderful tool. She experimented with various formats and techniques using colors in different ways and found that and found one that had extraordinary results. She is writing a book, Wellness Colors, Simple Tools to Empower Life, which um, which will be available pre-order in two days. Um, she also has a website, a subscription to receive uh, color uh, weekly color tools and other content and an app in development, an app in development. Look at you go. We need, we need to talk because um, <laughs> that's good. If you're, if you're on an app level, that's great. Uh, the goal, she says, is to use this extremely powerful tool that was used by the ancient Egyptians and Greeks. Here we are, boom. To enhance what is now available in the wellness toolbox. It is free. It has no side effects. Don't stare at the sun. And um, <laughs> is based on physics and frequencies as well as optical uh, physics. So yeah, I think the whole sun, sun staring thing like that is okay to do the first 30 minutes when it's setting or rising <laughs> but do not stare at it during the day like that's a thing to do for meditation but yeah anyhow miss carla um let's talk about it and let's let's crack open the egg here for about ancient egypt and when did you first learn that ancient egypt used because you're using the 12 colors the, the 12 chakras Break that down for us. What is this about now? How does the 12 chakras, the 12 colors, and ancient Egypt and ancient Greece all work out in what you're doing with color therapy? Well, okay. First of all, I have to say the book isn't in pre-launch yet. So put the two days off in the in the future. <laughs> and the website <laughs> no, okay. is in coming soon. You can go to the website and get on the, the mailing list to get but it's, and it's coming soon. The membership section is coming soon, but it's going to be probably a week or so. But the book, give me a couple of months because I'm still, I discovered a couple of things I want to include and it's going to change the format. So. Um, what a tease. I, it, I am so sorry. About that. But 
there is a website and it has a, uh, a mailing list. So you can get on that mailing list and then you'd be the first to know when it's going to be launched. So that's what I'm hoping that you'll do. Um, so what's happening now with the Egyptians is that it, I've always been fascinated. Chris, I was a closet archaeologist always. And even when I was in art school, I took art history classes that centered on um, pre-Columbian Mesoamerican art. And I was really into it and really, really into it to the point where, um, and Incan art as well, where I took a six-week course in, in Quechua and applied for a Fulbright scholarship to go to Peru and was one of the finalists. So, yeah, but I, I lost out to a textile artist, but that's okay. It, you know, those textile artists, they're just, they stick together, you know, they got the loom thing going. It's like, <laughs> that's awesome. You know, they're too ph photogenic with the loom and all that. Anyway, it's okay. <laughs> But um, so what we were, okay, what we were talking about is um, ancient Egypt. I, when I was researching, putting the book together, and actually just before I was doing, putting this podcast together, I thought, you know, I really should do a little more research into history because I know there is a history and everywhere I've read, and Ambika Waters mentions it, the history in Egypt, in Greece, and all along, you know, every culture has played with it. Um, and I couldn't find any direct, actual direct papyrus references saying this is this. But I did find a couple of things. So I know that, um, that there have been uh, Egyptian Egyptologists, they call them Egyptologists, who have mentioned that there were temples that they used specific um, types of gemstones. And the temples were built with specific uh, light, uh, I guess, um, holes in the ceiling or little uh, areas where the light can come in at a certain time when the sun is a certain place because the sun was very important to them. But then they had, when the sun came in a certain place, then they would have gemstones in a certain area so that the, the light would fracture through the gemstone and create color, a color stream. And a person could be in that color stream and essentially bathe in the color. Amethyst was a big one. They used a lot of amethyst. So, but I couldn't find any direct correlation to exact um, exactly what was going on and which temples were being used because for some reason some of that stuff is a little bit obscured by the uh, Egyptian authorities they're not they're great with oh yeah the pyramids here and all this you know and the temple of this and the tomb of that but when it gets into the very interesting unusual metaphysical findings they're they're not so free to let that out into the public so I couldn't find any direct things, but I did find a couple of uh, papyrus um, uh, visuals. So if you want me to just show you those, I'd be happy to. Let me just pull these up. Let me okay, see. great. Thank you. Yeah, a couple of these. And here's one. Okay, let's do this. And, whoops, sorry. <laughs> Let me do that again. I am not good at this. Okay, get into the right one, you. Okay, now I'm in the right one. Linda, do you have your viola? <laughs> no? Okay. No. <laughs> She still refuses. Oh. Uh, no, it's not doing it. Sorry. Let me just give you the small version. Okay. Maybe that'll help. Un petit. Okay. Do you, when did you? All right. Let's share this one. Okay. 
trying to make it bigger, but it won't get bigger. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Okay. This one, I think this is Akhenaten based on the shape of the head and the shape of the body. And I think it's from one of the later papyruses, but it's definitely oh. using, definitely using crystals. And definitely this is the sun. Hey, do this, do this. On the upper left-hand corner, click on where it says from current slide. Yeah, I know I did that. Oh, it isn't doing it. It's not doing it. I, All right, I no tried worries. to do it. Okay, no oh. worries. I'm sorry. i sorry. You go ahead. Do it. You go sorry. ahead. <laughs> so anyway, that's what we have here. And I'm trying to find out where this, if anybody knows where this is from, let me know. Send me a note because I really want to know. I'm going to follow this up. This is definitely Akhenaten. And this could be, um, this isn't ah. his wife because his wife had a long head. It's, it's other people. And this could be also one of the gods. But whatever it is, crystals and mm. sun rays. And then there's another one. It's very interesting. It looks and like here. Can I can I say real quick what I think it is? Yeah, sure. Because I feel like I think yep, like that would be one of the uh, Anunnaki um, or Anun or uh, who you said it was, and then a hybrid, and then another hybrid. Like I would say that the Could middle be. one is probably like a taller. Anyway, that that's my speculation. Um, is that that's interesting? But it's mm -hmm. not it's not Sumerian. It's Egyptian. So that's what makes it interesting. I have to be but able to it. read the hieroglyphics. And okay. I'm going to I'm going to send a note over to somebody to see if they can help me with that. Awesome. Cuz I or it's got to be this is I've seen this several places. There has to be a reference somewhere where it's from. But it's definitely definitely crystals that they're using. So, and then the other one, this one I got the name of Ray Harachti. And these are colored lights coming directly from the sun. So that would be in my, and it's just interesting because I don't know Egyptian stuff very well. I just know my my take on it from the celestial side, but that would be um, Ra. Like that is that is the blue avian Ra. And that is um, one of our celestial. Could be. Uh, yeah. Kin Absolutely. Right there. Yeah. But this, this definitely shows an understanding of color coming from the sun because absolutely look at this. I yeah mean, it's, it's rainbow like faded, it's rainbow it's a rainbow so um very very interesting and it's i wish i could wish it was a little bit more clear and but it has i these two are the only ones i could find and i did an enormous amount of research on this and uh the greeks came along later and they did something interesting and this is a modern reproduction of it they, um, this is, looks like it's Minoan, a Minoan, uh, cause they did a lot of painting of their stuff. This is, a uh, from the Metropolitan Museum of Art and it's a reproduction of a Minoan Sphinx, but this, is, there's a, uh, professor who is doing research in the Metropolitan right now, who is reproducing the color that was on the original um, pieces. So they used an enormous amount of color, but I couldn't find any reference in a visual image to show how they used color in, um, for medical purposes, because I read about it. Hippocrates apparently was aware of it. Aristotle was aware of it, but it, it's hard because we don't see any, any, there are no papyruses, Greek papyruses that are, that show or, um, that show Aristotle working or Hippocrates working. So we only have statues and we have, you know, the fact that they use color for everything. And now, maybe, you know, in Pompeii, it has color everywhere. Oh, Pompeii does. Okay. That's interesting too. Absolutely. Is, now, now, is this a lion's body? This is, is this a lion's this is body? This a sphinx. This is a, a sphinx. But it's the body of that of a lion though. Yeah. You body know. of a lion, head okay. of um, a Minoan. Um, I person, and this is for this is Greece, and I couldn't find the uh, the reference to the exact period. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. But they did reproduce what they actually found, and just did an actual painting of what they actually found because it was faded, and they did studies on it. This is from the Met. 
Metropolitan okay. Museum. So, and of course, you know, we know that my friend and yours, Isaac Newton, <laughs> came up with the whole prism thing. Oh, sure, yeah. So I really, I really like Isaac Newton. I think he was gutsy. So um, anyway, so if that helps you a little well, bit. Well, so now, yeah, and but I, I do know, I mean, like you can, um, you can certainly find information about uh, ancient Egypt and, and people using, I mean, there's people have done research on that for, for sure. Like there being places where you, you go into specific areas for specific frequency healings within certain chambers. Um, Rosetta, did you have your hand up? Did I see you? Oh, okay. All right. You're just doing dang, gang signs again. I, would, I told you not to do that on the show. She does it on the show. And I'm like, don't don't bring your gang stuff on the show. Um, did you have a question, Jason? More of a comment. Um, okay. Yes. I think it's, I think that that whole wave of like the color as medicine, um, the holistic approach is coming back. Like you see all these things now, specifically, like if we're talking around the skin, you have this red light therapy that all these people are doing, right? Because it's, it helps uh, replenish the collagen in the skin. It's supposed to do all these miraculous things like regrow your hair, tighten, lift, unwrinkle, um, promote circulation. Um, and then, you know, I feel like I've, I feel like I've seen, somewhere whether it's in my head or on a program i can't remember at this point um you know we talk about these med beds right and some people are like oh it pulls up this holographic projection of your body and you do this and that very well may be the case with some of them um but i feel like the ones that i've seen it's all about color so like you're on this bed and then it's just this colored light and, you know, depending on the color or the frequency, it does different things for the body. Um, and I think that, like, we really, it, more people know about it, I feel like. It's like this big secret that we're used to. Because if you look at places like hospitals, hospitals are never really red and oranges and yellows, right? There are these healing cool colors. There are these blues and these greens and these whites. And when you look at fast food restaurants where their goal is in and out, right? They're always reds, red yellows, and yellow, mm -hmm. these colors that are supposed to make you feel uncomfortable. So you won't stay and just lounge. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's really interesting to kind of see all of this come back around specifically with the light technology as a healing modality. Um, it's fascinating. And I think that it's, it's slowly but surely starting to um, come back around. And then if we can only get on board with using it, like you said, in the combination with the sound frequency, you know, it's, it's, I feel like it would just, uh, re um, relief, relieve the need for certain medical things that of course are going to cause, you know, corporations to lose money because <gasps> light is free. Right. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's really interesting <laughs> to see how it's all working out. So I actually do have a question. I decided I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I've heard a lot, you know, about green and pink bees associated with the heart chakra, and I always feel a little confused. Like, um, like is the heart chakra green or pink, or is it both, or um, just I guess if you can maybe go into a little bit more depth about uh what the heart chakra really is and what oh. color the heart chakra really is and how to better use that yes i actually i can do that hold on a second i have my cheat sheet here um okay first of all the colors that are associated with each of the major chakras and then there are others too there are other colors and the reason why I mentioned 12 colors, because when I, in my research, I found that um, Dean Shash Gadiali, who did, who created in the early, early to 20th century, um, this concept of using color and then adding sound as uh, he created a system called spectrotometry. He was an Indian doctor. And he and then his sons later, his children later carried on with that and called it the 49th vibrational 
technique and it was a technique, but it was geared as he was very, I mean, he was schooled as a physician uh, to very specific frequencies of, of color and of, um, of sound. And coming from a non-Western background, he was very familiar with the chakras and the colors associated with them, which is almost common knowledge to anybody that has studied anything in Buddhism and, and Hinduism and knows anything about the chakras. And if you've done more than just exercise yoga, then you've, then you've seen that chakras are the centers in energy centers in the body, and they are associated with different frequencies. And the frequencies associate with the colors that come out of the visible spectrum. So each chakra has a frequency that resonates with the frequency of a specific color, but it's not that cut and dried. It's not because humans, as we all know, are complex organisms and it is not finite, it is holistic. So that's why this is an art and a science and why it's so exciting. Because otherwise, I wouldn't have a chance to create something if I wasn't a physicist. Because they would say, you have to have the precise, how are you going to measure the precise physics? But I found a way that is completely different than, than what you would think and easier to use and still has benefits. It's not medical because I don't want to go there because that's when you do need precision and you need to quantify and you need to peer review and all that but it's preventive and it, you can use it as you would use anything during the day. Like, Oh God, I have a headache. I need to eat something, you know, or something just self-care oriented, but a different tool that gives you like a powerful boost or a powerful calming. Um, so the heart chakra itself is in the center of the body and it is associated with the color green and the greens, and it is considered a neutral because there are the, um, the chakras that go up and the chakras that go down. And um, the, one, the ones that are associated with the 49th vibrational technique are more than just the seven chakras. The seven chakras are the, uh, the crown, the brow, the pineal gland, the uh, throat, the, um, the heart, the solar plexus and the sacral and the root chakra. So, but then there are others. In fact, there are hundreds of chakras, maybe thousands of chakras that are energy centers of the body. Of course, that was too much for me to handle the thousands, but thinking about the additional body mechanisms, there are, uh, there are colors that are associated with the circulatory system. And also, which goes down to actually maybe more the vibration of the body in the circulation system. Um, there's, and I'll tell you, do you want me to just say all the chakras or just show you and talk to you about it? Well, I think that um, she, Rosetta's question was, is it pink or green? Because we do hear pink. Oh, pink. Okay. Pink is a combination of red and white. It's a tone but it also may have a little bit of orange in it. And it's, it's, a, it's a color that is considered secondary or tertiary color that, that interacts with the heart chakra and with the green, but pink has a very strong connection with the um, maternal instinct and also uh, with healing for that's hard to say. I'm not sure how to say this. Um, the female side, it could be the, the female of, you know, side, but it's a, it's a nurturing color. Green itself, <clears throat> the heart chakra is neutral. So it doesn't, it's calming, it's neutral, it balances others. Pink itself is nurturing, has a specific nurturing vibration. So the reason why they use pink with little girls stuff is thinking, oh, how cute it's, a, but you know, it can be overused as well, but it is very, very effective for nurturing um, 
you know, un uncomfortable babies or something, the color itself has an immediate effect on the uh, on the psyche. Uh, certain types of pink, and the combination of green and pink is heart and nurturing. So when you think of different combinations that you can put that together for different situations, you see it isn't so finite. It isn't so specific. You can adjust it different ways. And I actually was in an office the other day uh, that's a center for um, family research and adoption and things like that. It has nothing to do with what I'm doing here. But um, I was visiting a friend and it was their new offices and their new offices have a mural and they work with uh, families and birth mothers and children and stuff. The mural is pink and green, but it's not just pink, green, abstract, it's flowers, pink flowers, green, and a little bit drawing, you know, it's not photographic quality. So it was very soothing, but it was definitely geared toward that particular business. They knew what they were doing. And this is true. Cat, they're doing it. They're doing it in hospitals. They're yeah. doing it in children's rooms. They're very so careful. I, I want because I want to talk about that now. Where, um, but I want to bring this into your your Fay aspect, and I want to bring it into your your personal awakening as well. Because, um, you know, like you are you are showing up in the world, and you're teaching people how to use color to heal their lives. But you're not talking about chakras. You're not talking about frequencies. You're you're approaching it from a very different from uh, from um. You're able to to translate it to that uh, left brain, you know, where, you know, the non-creative where I, it's safe because you didn't, you didn't get woo woo. So I'd say, if I can buy the book, I can do these things so I can make my life better because you didn't make it scary and spiritual. Um, so you're, you're able to do that, but I'm wondering in terms of like, you know, when did you start first start to realize that you were working with the Fae? When did you first start to realize that you, you know, that you were connected to these other, other, this other symphony of energy that was coming through you, did that happen at that time when you created this beautiful crystalline or this beautiful collage of, of glass? Or did that come later? When was your, what was your awakening experience like? Oh, I met Marguerite Riglioso. Um, she's, uh, she should be on the show. Um, she's done a lot of research in um, Mary Magdalene and the, um, that genre of research. She's actually really well known now. She was at the time she wasn't, she was sort of getting there and she was working on it. And I had a, and when I'm talking meet, I'm talking virtually because I didn't go out and meet people, <laughs> but I talked to her on the phone. We had a, a meeting, we had a short session um, and I've been following her and we, and her interest was also in the Fae. And at that time, I was, I was suddenly interested in my, if I have Celtic um, connections and why all of a sudden I'm noticing things and nobody else is. And even the closest relative that I have, my sister, doesn't notice things. Um, and so I was curious about how someone could have fake connections but have none in their ancestry or at least immediate family and that disconnection or maybe DNA. And that's always fascinated me how DNA can connect with a human, one human, but none of the other relatives. And I thought DNA was like instilled. DNA is adjustable. It is adjustable. I didn't realize that it's adjustable in vitrio it's adjustable in your life it can be adjusted by any um any of them you know any of our friends our guides our people that come here and want to like interact with us they can adjust our dna so we can do this or that or see things differently so i had a i had a little bit of a thing she was saying oh i wonder if you're connected to the fae and so we had a little discussion and she's going i think you're connected to the fae and I said, no, really. We had a little discussion about it, but it was always in my mind. And um, then I read Tannis Hellewell's book on hybrids. You remember that, Kat? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. She was on our that show. That was yeah. interesting. She was, 
because that's when I discovered DNA is not ingrained in a line of, of evolution. It's adjustable. So that's how the hybrids exist is they're in with these adjustments and then they're there. So then I thought, oh, this is interesting as a possibility, along with a, probably a bunch of others. And so that's kind of how that happened. But these things can be in my subconscious for a while and then pop out again, like when you and I were discussing it. And then you said, oh, well, this is a Fay thing. And then it occurred to me to keep things quiet or to keep make them um, a, make this tool something that could be used by people that are very limited in their ability to understand or to believe. Their belief system has to be a certain way and they can do things outside of their belief system if their belief is not challenged, if you understand me. Like they can do something that helps them if their belief system is not challenged and you can call it anything. You could call it ice cream as long as their belief system isn't challenged and they don't hear this, the trigger words that challenges their belief system. And I didn't, I wanted to create something that could be used by anyone that has any belief system, no matter how limited, because in a way it breaks it with experience. People that have beliefs that have experiences that are really outside their beliefs, it starts to put a crack in the beliefs. And in a way that's good. Oh, if their it's, experiences are positive, of course, you know. I think it's huge. Again, I think that's the whole, that's the business of the Fae is sneaking in, looking like one thing until you finally realize that it's too late and they're there and they've already cast a spell around you or broken a spell that was put around you. You know, whatever the magic is that they're doing, however they're supporting you, and you have, you know, you're sneaking in into the corporate world and saying, hey, we can work with color. It's this is here's some great information around color. And wouldn't it be wouldn't it be great if working with color in the therapeutic way became very trendy and chic the way yoga did? Right. And it becomes something where it's like taking care of yourself is now including color. It's including color therapy, sound therapy, frequency therapy. You can call it whatever you want. You know, you can call it homeopathy. If that makes you feel safe, you can call it homeopathy. And if it doesn't make you feel safe, then don't call it that. Call it something else. But like, but it's okay. Like you're bringing it out to the masses, which I think is gorgeous. Um, I need to step away for a quick moment. I was going to ask if sure. Miss Linda um, could um, uh, hop in, and I'll, I'll be back in just a, sec a moment. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. So, so Carla, I want to talk about with um, how you bring color into an environment. Um, for a client or how you would recommend them bring color into an environment to change where they are possibly at or to create a more enriched environment? How do you change those frequencies? So if you've got somebody who um, maybe is depressed or is, or somebody who is stuck in a pattern and wants to change their their everyday life what's a good way to start for them the practical means of using color to change their external world to help them change their internal oh um actually i was thinking about this a lot because when i wrote my book um how to find and love your small space i was dealing with people who wanted to live in studio apartments and those are not you can't, you don't get a designer to come in and redo a studio apartment. You're getting it. You can't put anything on the walls. You have to be careful about because it it's usually a rental. And so how do you make it so you can live comfortably in it and put color in it without causing major issues? So I have a couple of ideas about that. Um, depending on, I mean, I don't know what colors you're thinking of, but there would be like more of a, a holistic uh, analysis of what the person needs and how to change it. Uh, two things: if they, if you were talking, um, if there is a sofa, two things. Depends on what they see every day, what they're doing every day. Um, I would start with a full spectrum floor lamp. 
so that they have full spectrum light because that's the first thing that when you have um, something in your home and it doesn't feel right and it isn't there and you feel like you can't move forward, you can't, there's a basic issue with light here. So you can't get the sun in your house, but you can get a full spectrum light. They're inexpensive. They work. And just a floor lamp works. If you have, you know, I don't have a lot of counter space or places to put things. So I have to use a floor lamp. But if you have that, you can have like a desk lamp or side lamp or whatever, full spectrum light. Then, and that's like a very small uh, investment under $100, maybe 60 or something. And they last like 100 years. And then I would go with, um, depending on if, what surfaces you, you're, the person is looking at, are they looking at sofas? Are they looking at, are they working in their bedroom so they see a bedspread? What do they, what do they see? You know, what do they have in front of them that they're, so I would, I would go with fabric because I'm a big fabric. I believe that the, the vibrations and fabric are wonderful. The colors are beautiful. The, um, the fact that it's fabric is some, somehow it's softer in the environment than uh, paint or even a oil painting or something, acrylic painting. There's something about fabric. It's just very soft and inviting. So I would go with throw pillows and um, and throws. And, and That's I what guess I would another, do. okay. And another question, I guess, following that, um, when you when you understand the colors of the chakras, and let's say um, you just are really uh, struggling in your heart chakra. Um, it is um, way out there. You're really emotional. Would you bring in a color that brings more of that? Or would you look at what's above and below on the chakras that may be out of whack and bring some of that in to help balance that? Well, you just said it. That's the goal. Balance. That's the whole goal. And what my tool does, and I'll, I'll demonstrate it. I mean, I have a rudimentary couple of versions of it. I know we, I'm checking the time, um, but it's to either soothe or stimulate to achieve balance. That's all you, I'm making it as simple as possible with people, everybody, fundamentalist Christians from the Bible Baptist Church of Bakersfield, where I had to go, could say soothe or stimulate. They could say it and they wouldn't get in trouble. Yeah, I need to like soothe, soothe or stimulate because I'm just feeling down today and I have to get this work done. They can do it. They can say it. So that's the, the balance in the chakras is the goal as well. And that's always been the goal. When something's out of whack and if you go to a practitioner that works in this with all their equipment and everything, they will be able to see where there's an imbalance in part of your chakras and they would be able to do something to try to bring that back when you're just on the basic basic simple level is if you're out of whack in something bring in the opposite that balances it so if for instance um you're you're having trouble with the emotions the emotions are out there um, you want to rein in the emotions. You want to bring in more, um, intellect and to soothe the emotions. It's like an inflammation of the emotions. So you want to bring something in to, to counter that and soothe it. So you have balance blue and turquoise, which you're wearing. Turquoise is a power color, super power color. I have one I was going to show you because I'm working on, I'm um, researching three things, pure colors, uh, patterned colors, well, also in, in combinations of colors because the combinations are just powerful too, and then animated. So, so that when you're doing a little exercise, you're, you're focused on the animated. 
let's let's hop in. You got because you got a couple of videos on that. I thought maybe now would be a time because you had the turquoise and the lemon. Did you want to show those things? Oh, I didn't do the lemon. Actually, I can do the lemon. I can show you what lemon is. Turquoise is a powerful color. Lemon is one that nobody's heard of. It's um, a combination I've heard of, of lemon. green and yellow. You've heard of it. It's <laughs> we all, we've all heard of lemons. What are you talking about? <laughs> no one's heard of lemon before. Everybody People in the back are going lemon. <laughs> <laughs> Lemon Jefferson, yeah, we have that. We have <laughs> long. We have an LP of Lemon Jefferson, Blind Lemon. Okay, so lemon is is has to do with it's yellow and green. So it's it's the solar plexus, the power center. It's power. It's energy, but it's also heart. So it's a combination. So what it does is it soothes and it stimulates. And, and it works really well on a stomach ache. I'm not saying, I'm disclaimer, this is not medical advice. If you need medical advice, please go to a, a accredited medical practitioner in your, in your area. So otherwise, but if you have a stomach ache and you're just thinking, oh God, my stomach's feeling a little weird, lemon will make a huge difference. And I can, I'll show you in a minute how to do that. I know we have a little bit of time here. Um, so uh, I'm sorry, what did you say? I've, I forgot. Well, we were just yeah. talking, because you said you had, you had videos that we talked about before, oh, the but, video. Maybe, yeah. but maybe you don't have that and that's okay if you don't. No, I, ha um, I what I did was I didn't make it into a video because I thought it would be a little too, uh, it wouldn't give us enough time to talk in the, in the middle. Okay. So I thought I would just do it in separate slides. Okay. So let me show you what I came up with. There's okay. a couple of things I came up with and I'm still working on it. But what I'm doing is, uh, and this is what I found. Okay, first of all, let me show you one and then I'll tell you what I found in my research that'll just knock your socks off. So when Linda gets back, she's running off. <laughs> she's coming back. Okay. All right, let me find it. And let's see. I'm going to show you my original research that I found. I'm going to start with turquoise. And what I did was I, I matched the, um, and this is, I mean, this is something I had to look up. I didn't make it up. I had to match the actual sound that is associated with that particular color because the it, they vibrate at similar frequencies and each one has its own sound, but they're not exactly the same in the two modalities. In homeopathy, the, the musical note is different than the musical note in the 49th vibrational technique, which is interesting. So I think it's, I'm, based on what I've seen, it's not an exact science, but and the music does enhance the quality of the color. So let's do turquoise. Is Jason leave? Oh, he might have had to take a bio break. It's okay. Okay. So let me bring it up. And then when he comes back, I'll, I'll show you. You, you, know. you can go ahead. You can just go ahead and do it. We don't need to wait for him. Okay. His loss at Jason. That's what you get. <laughs> okay. Let me see. Okay, when I did my thesis, I worked on one thing. I took the actual 49th vibrational. Let me see what it is. I'll show you the thesis. Um, I took the information and I did research on it and I did experiments with it. And this is just the plain turquoise. Can you see it? Yes. Good. So um, I connected the actual um, tone to the actual color. So you can hear it. And I put this thing here. Although in my final thesis, it was hidden, but this is my working copy.
Okay. You get the idea. This is so um, now those tones are the, the combined sound of turquoise. C sharp. C sharp is correlated with turquoise. I mean, okay. They vibrate together. They resonate together. Um, and let me tell you what I did after that. You just find the other one. So the C sharp and the turquoise together make enhance the most that you can get out of the optical color therapy in the sense that you see it. It's not being applied to your body with colored lights like some of the therapists do for medical purposes. This is for just balancing your chakras. Now, what I found was really interesting. So I have created also a couple of other different ways to see turquoise. Here's one, and I will show you. Here's one. When you see, and I'm going to make a video of this. So it's, so you see it moving like I did with, I did one with lemon to see it moving over a period of time. So when you do that, it focuses your, um, focuses you a little bit more when you're, okay, stop sharing this. So did you, were you able to see that? Cause it, the screen yeah. share stopped. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, the actual technique is to have a three minute or a five minute period of time where you're, you don't have to use the sound, but you can with headphones or whatever, where you're concentrating on the color. Now you can concentrate on the color and think, other things and it won't help you that much. But if you really, but for three minutes or five minutes, you can like make yourself think about what you want to do. Um, blue is a good one if you're, if you're in the middle of something and you have to do something big, like you have to speak or you have to do something or at work, you have to give a presentation, you have to go to a meeting and you need to ask some questions. I know I'm keeping an eye on it. And so blue is very good for that, um, for just focusing three minutes. And that's why I'm creating the app, but because then it'll be available always. But there are also, there's something I discovered that's extremely important and no one else has discovered. And I may as well tell you, it's not like somebody's going to rush out and, you know, grab this and make it into, um, the thing that I found when I did my experiments is that first of all, you have to have, in order to have it be most optimum effective, you have to have some source of light that's from the sun. So you can't be wearing glasses, <laughs> sorry. Glasses will, will filter too much of it. So you have to take your glasses off. And then if you have a full spectrum light behind you, that works perfectly. If you're outside, you can do it. Take your glasses off and watch it. Now, the colors that you can get in creating colors in, on a computer are not specifically tuned to the exact frequency. And what I found was that if you have a full spectrum light that is in your environment, or you're in a sunlight environment, your, your body will tune it. And there's evidence of that. So for instance, if you're, it's hard to do it indoors, but if you're in a full spectrum and then um, you have that behind you, which I did with the experiments, and, or if you're outside sitting on a park bench and you're three minutes in, you start to see glasses off. Of course, you're looking at the color, but all of a sudden the borders are changing. They're getting darker. 
that means your body is tuning the frequency because it has sun source available. And so it's, it's interpreting the frequency of the color and it's tuning it. So you have an approximate color because there's no way to do it otherwise. Approximate color because who knows what your, you know, what your, your phone can do, what the computer can do. And once it recognizes the approximate color, it's going to tune it and you're going to see it in a border around the, the slide or whatever that you're seeing. And even if you're seeing a video or something, so it's easier to concentrate on it, it's going to tune the color. So that was like extraordinary. And I discussed it with my, um, my advisor at the Holistic Arts Institute. And she said, that was incredible. I've never heard of this, but it I happened have, every single time. I have not either. That is very exciting. Um, so we do have some uh, comments here. Uh, Laura says, I started learning about the correlation between color and sound many years ago. It was something I wanted to dive into more, but never got around to it. Um, I love that Carla is bringing us this to the light. Um, I want to ask the other co-hosts if they want to step in as we're going to start to wind up the show here at this juncture. I just want to, one of the things that keeps coming in visually for me, um, which I've seen it in the past, but I couldn't pinpoint what, what the connection was. You know, the, the sensory pods where you're in water. How beautiful would that be combining your colors, perhaps the patterns on the top, instead of it being deprivation, having it be the color and the frequency, the sounds, especially if you could tie in um, bowls as the sound to pull that in. But to be able to, to go into those pods for treatment for uh, aligning your chakras, for restoration, um, and bringing that into balance and have, have it programmable by someone. <laughs> ah, you, Absolutely. You really, it, just, it just, for me, it just feels really yummy. <laughs> it's absolutely in the works, I'm sure, in the future. We have to, you know, as a culture, we have to go, get beyond being primitive but it's absolutely there. All of the components are here. They're all here. We can put it together. And the sounds are not just, I, this is very primitive what I put together. The sounds can be all kinds of sounds. There are flute sounds, there are natural sounds, but they're co correlated to um, a musical note that is consistent with that particular color constantly, but it doesn't necessarily have to be music. Mm -hmm. There are natural sounds that, that correlate with that musical note as well. So you're right, pods, absolutely. And so let's start, thinking, you know, absolutely. Hey, Linda, we're going to start something. I think, I think so. <laughs> I, I, and I'm we'll also do. having this image of when you, I don't know who's done this or hasn't done this, lying underneath the piano when it's being played. If you have not had that experience, go find no. one and do it because you get the vibration of the notes coming down as a full musical bath of frequency. And that, so I'm thinking that that Ooh. live vibration. Okay, here happening. we go. Our <laughs> installation, we got the piano, we got the pods, we got the color. We're gonna do this whole sensory experience where you're in the pod, <laughs> the pod is under a piano. Carla's lights, colors are going. Like, I think that we've got, this is going to be a full sensory experience. Hmm. Uh, I'm in orgasmic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, there are a lot of empty, like, storefronts in, in New York City. You know, they do that stuff all the time. Little, you know. See, we'll do it. We'll do there it here in Omaha. We're going to do it here in Omaha. We'll bring you from New York. We'll bring Linda from the, we'll bring the coast together. We're going to do it in Omaha. Um, did Jason or Rosetta or Linda, you have any follow-up? I don't mean to cut anybody off. 
Hey, you, you've talked about the full spectrum light. And is that kind of like a plant grow light? Would that be on the same line or is a full spectrum oh, light something completely yes. different? No, no, it isn't different. It is okay. just, yeah, it's not different at all. It's actually available. Um, it is the light that has almost the entire spectrum, except it doesn't have, it has maybe a little bit of ultraviolet, but not that much, tiny little bit, but they usually try to keep ultraviolet and infrared out. So it's visible spectrum, but it's definitely, I mean, think about it, you know, the plants have to have a full mm -hmm. spectrum in order to, to, to thrive. We're photosynthetic organisms. Mm -hmm. We need solar light in order to process vitamin D. So we need that. We can't just use fluorescent light or incandescent light. It doesn't work because it doesn't have all of the, the colors in the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's like, it's available. It's been available for years and years and years, full spectrum. Well, I just, just this past year, uh, I decided I want to do a basement garden experiment and so I got a bunch of they're actually they're only about $17 they're um, a clip-on plant grow light so you can clip them on wherever and um, and every time I would go into the basement as soon as I put them up I just felt so much better and then I put a couple plants in my my room and so I brought them up and put it in my room and I love going into my room because it's just I had those um, plant grow lights um, up and it just is a wonderful experience just walking into my room and feeling that just it, it just completely changed the energy of my whole room oh it's <laughs> it's shocking it's shocking why they don't have full spectrum lights everywhere it doesn't well, and it doesn't make have, sense and they have led lights now which are even worse than like led lights just are like so bad for your eyes yeah i know um, so don't do LED. I, I like if you have to do it, do it short term, but do not leave your do not use lean into LED lights because that will actually damage your vision. From what I understand, I'm not a doctor. That's my that's, research it yourself. Find out if it's true. Um, <laughs> Thanks. One last thing on that. If yeah. you are working in an office environment or you're working in an area that there are fluorescent lights and you keep getting migraines, you actually can get them to change them to full spectrum light bulbs. If you get a doctor's note, they have to actually accommodate that if it's associated. That's oh, under ADA? Yeah. Did you use ADA for that? Yes, I did. Ew. Yeah, I kept getting migraines. So great. They, they did change it, and, and which in turn ended up changing the whole office because they hated the aesthetics that there was one light that was different <laughs> in the entire office. Oh. And everybody wanted that one light. And so they ended up changing the entire office to full spectrum. Did it oh, change that's awesome. the vibe? Oh. Yeah, it did change. Good. Um, yeah, well, I mean, it was one of those things where people kept hanging around my area because of the light and started requesting it. Of course, it was. This is so simple, like, isn't it? <laughs> so right, simple. right, right. Exactly. That's it's like, why, why are things designed specifically to make us sicker? That's the big question. Um, why are we not considered in the human factor at all? We're, we're, it's like production. Production is the most important thing. Saving costs, saving, you know, it's like mm -hmm. money, money, money. And every and humans are put on the, you know, uh, don't get me started. But anyhow, I they actually <laughs> did a cost analysis of yeah. at the time I stopped missing from work with the migraine. Ah. And they were able to justify switching out all of the lights based on That's me. Oh, that's, that's incredible. Awesome. Back to cost wow. analysis. Yeah. So that's not even that's that's even a bullshit thing. That's not even a real thing. Not even a bullshit thing. They actually it's changed everything thing. Thing because they figured there would be less sick days and it would only take so many hours of a person to compensate for the entire floor being changed. Wow. So there are things well, we can do. Yeah, just, I believe in just doing that. <laughs> just don't don't try to like go to the authorities and say, "Well, we need this because why aren't you doing that?" Forget it. Yeah. They're you know it's like you're they're primitive, so just do it. And that's why I'm trying to make it simple. So you just do it. And take care of yourself. Tell other yeah. people about it. They do it. Eventually, something will catch on, or maybe it'll just ooze into the the hierarchy. So 
Well, Sorry. that's part of it's, that's part of our evolution right now, right? We're just going to do it. We're going to do it ourselves. It's not being given to us. We're going to do it ourselves. Speaking yeah. of doing it, your, doing it yourself, sisters are doing it for themselves. Jason, any last questions? Uh, <laughs> kind of a, a comment, not really a question. One, I want to piggyback off of what Rosetta said, because um, I think it's also a great alternative to bring color into a small space that would be plants, right? And so not only do you have the color, but you have this living organism mm-hmm. that has its own energetic field. So I think that's a great idea. But it keeps all this talk about color and vibration. I, it takes me back to, was it Maria that was talking about putting like the the strips of, co- like putting a glass cup of water on top of um, like something that was colored? Yes. Was, yeah. That was, I, yep. Yep. That was um, our second show with her. Yes. Yeah. So like combining that idea and we know that sound can influence the shape of water, mm-hmm. right? Because it holds memory. Mm-hmm. So what if you have this combination of, okay, I have this glass vessel on top of this, whatever color it is that I'm wanting to work with. So my water is being infused by the vibration of the color. Mm -hmm. And if I go ahead and play the resonating sound of the color, so it's kind of getting the double whammy um, and altering the shape of the water with the vibration, but also infusing it with the light codes of the color. Just, you know, and I know Jason, you're right. That's a homeopathic remedy. Exactly. A homeopathic remedy. It's called um, something about crystal infusion, water infusion. It's exactly, oh, sometimes they use crystals to infuse it, but I think I think there's a better way to do it to just, you can use colored paper. I used yeah. turquoise colored paper to calm down somebody's panic attack once. Just look at this. <laughs> and it worked. Just use colored paper. I mean, it doesn't have to be exact, but yeah, you're right. I think with Maria, also because I feel like I, need, I still haven't done it. I said I was going to go to the like local Home Depot store and get you know little paint swatches. They're free. Yeah, and there's so many different shades, right? So you can just go make a run through, walk out with twenty different colors. Hey, that sounds yeah. like fun. That sounds great. So, um, Miss uh, Carla, I want to ask our little final question to you. And, um, well, also I just wanted to say, because all of this is happening, like, again, you know, color, sound, uh, vibration, it's all accessible to us. Why is everything such a mystery? Why is it so weird? You know, the buffo frog, (laughs) the, the toad, the buffo toad, where this amazing, um, medicine comes from to connect you to source. It's, it's, it's a toad. It's right. It's a, it's a frog. You know, you're like, you go down to a river. Like it's just like, why is, these things are right next to us all the time. And yet they're somehow mysterious or disguised or forbidden. They're in our, where they're in our hands reach. People wanted to make vitamin C something that had to be approved by the FDA. It comes from oranges. Like, are you kidding me? So um, with all that, my final rant on that, um, and I like to wear black, but I also wear things with black. So I think like you can also balance your colors. So okay, anyhow, yeah, yeah. Um, but I want to say, Carla, what is your final thought to to your from your heart to ours, um, your your heart, colorful heart to the colorful hearts of our audience? Join me in this journey. Join me. Sign up for news alerts at wellnessandcolors.com. Give me your email address. Tell me a little thing about yourself if you're interested in certain things. Join me and I'll let you know because I'm I'm doing this and it's going to be out there and it's going to be available. And I need an, I need people to to come with me. Just join me. Just doesn't cost anything. I'm going to be sending out information. Eventually I'll have a membership that's like really cheap, like nine bucks a month or something to support my work. But, you know, join me now. It doesn't cost anything and I'll give you information and you can help me with the feedback of how it's helped you. (laughs) Wellnessandcolors.com. I have a Carla Macbeth Army Hashtag, hashtag Carla Macbeth Army. So that way we can join your your, (laughs) uh, movement. (laughs) <laughs> um so i think that's i think that's great i think i'm i'll join your army i'm in i'm in um thank you miss carla i'm gonna flip us into the brady bunch view and um miss linda would you grab the mic and lead us out absolutely 
Uh, everyone who joined us today, thank you for being such amazing salon members. Remember to hit that like button, share, subscribe if you haven't, and check out Carla's book. Check out her app that's coming in on that list, and we can change the world through helping ourselves as we um, grow into who we are um, already. That, I know that sounds like a big loop, but we're already there. We just have to remember it, okay? Yeah. And these are tools to help us get there. Um, check the links below. And um, Rosetta, Jason, thank you again for adding so much to uh, our podcast. Your presence <laughs> is always amazing. So thank you. And with that, Kat, who do we have next week? Next week, we've got Jay Clay, um, Jelani Clay. So uh, Jelani Clay is an R&B artist he, who I met um, through the Celebration of Consciousness with uh, Lorelai Drock and uh, Loretta, um, who interviewed uh, Linda Coulter-Burge on our show. She, she's one of the people that inv in, 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 interviewed Loretta. Loretta interviewed Linda, sorry. And so there's this whole little like nest of people that are growing from the uh, Celebration of Consciousness. Uh, Jay Clay is one of them. He was in our first uh, event and his music is so uplifting. Like, even though it's really uplifting, it just, it hits your heart. He's just, uh, he's magic. And so he's just a great guy. Uh, I, we did a pre-show chat and I started to like tune into all of the stuff that he's going to be doing in terms of collaboration. So his energy is just superior. His message is superior and it's very empowering, very uplifting and very heart to heart. So I'm super excited to have him on. Um, and with that, yeah, that's going to be at our same time next week and I won't be at a coffee shop, so that'll probably be a little bit more <laughs> conducive. Um, but with that, we just want to say thank you everyone for being here with mm. us and thank you, Carla, Linda, Rosetta, mm, Jason, you. all of our live streamers. It was just an absolute pleasure to be here with you today. Um, please join our Facebook group down below for more conversations and we'll, we'll see you there. And, and other, otherwise we will see you next week. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Right.